Hey everyone, Brian Zane here. Welcome to part two of my interview with the creator of Wrestling Society X, Kevin Kleinrock. Now Kevin, let's talk about the most controversial moment in the show's history. Episode four, Ricky Banderas throwing a fireball in Vampiro's face. Actually, that segment never made it to air on MTV. Can you tell us more about what happened there? So when you do a fireball spot, a lot of times, you know, different people throw fireballs different ways. But one of the common ways to do it is to take about two or three sheets of flash paper, like the flash paper, and throw it. Well, there was a bit of a miscue, and Banderas had not been handed two or three sheets of flash paper, but two or three, two books of flash paper, and ended up throwing these two complete pages uh, or, or books of flash paper at Vampiro's head which then proceeded to catch fire. Uh, his hair literally was on fire and he was rolling around on the ground um, actually trying to get it to go out. So once we got that into editing, uh, MTV, because you know, fire in and of itself is a, is a very big no-no and since somebody actually was lit on fire, they did not want to see that. I had kind of begged and pleaded and we had wanted to kind of go old school to like the, you know, the, the, the 60s, 70s, maybe even early 80s of wrestling, where we just put up like a big X uh, and we blocked it out that way. And MTV was insistent that we instead use special effects to make it seem like it was an energy blast or a Klingon death ray or something. I feel like we went back and forth at least five or six times over the course of a week or two um, saying, how about we do it this way? And they're like, nope, it's got to be even more ridiculous that we know it's not fire and we know it's not real. And the sound effect and the video effect. And so that's kind of how that all came to be. Now, there are a lot of people out there who think the fireball spot ultimately led to Wrestling Society X's cancellation for being too violent and too over the top. What was your take on that? What do you think actually led to the downfall of the show? The legend or the rumor, I guess, about that being what caused MTV to take it off the air, completely false. Um, what had happened was, you know, the show, we were, like I mentioned before, we were part of a block of four shows. And none of the shows were performing well in the ratings. Um, and so MTV did what networks, especially MTV, kind of do. And they started playing with different strategies as to how do we make people watch this? You know, I think a lot of times wrestling fans aren't used to being part of that conversation because wrestling shows are usually 52 weeks a year. They don't get canceled except for like at the end of a year, like what we've seen you know, lately with, with TNA and their different negotiations over the last few years. But this was really just all part of being a television show. And so it just kind of happened to coincide with the fireball. And it just kind of became this urban legend uh, that the fireball spot was really what killed the show on MTV. But what killed the show on MTV was really the fact that you know, before the first episode even aired, um, you know, I'm fairly certain that MTV started second guessing, should we even have wrestling on? When we started talking about time slots for the show, we told them the only time slot in the entire week you should not put us on is Tuesdays at 10.30 p.m. Because that's when ECW was airing. I thought that, you know, the kind of, the kind of audience that we were finding or that we were trying to find it would be less damaging to us if we were even up on Monday nights against Raw than if we were against the ECW show. And sure enough, the guy block ended up on Tuesday nights and they put us up at 1030. So ECW was on the air, already had a half hour to promote what was coming up next. And then we were on right smack dab in the middle of ECW. Any other night of the week, I think we would have done significantly better in the ratings. I mean, you know, our rating was small anyway. So even getting a, a small bump in the ratings percentage wise would have been huge and would, would have potentially even like doubled what our audience was. Wow. So talk to me about where you were. How did you find out about Wrestling Society X being canceled? You know, it's really funny because 
I don't know how many of your viewers follow kind of like the big internet wrestling sites. Um, you know, the, the Observer and, and PW Insider and, and sites like that. And it really always seems like those sites have connections and informants everywhere. Um, and I can tell you, it is absolutely true because I found out that our show was being canceled from Mike Johnson of PW Insider before any of us found out from the network because he had somebody within Viacom that had heard that uh, the show was going to be canceled. And as a friend, he, you know, gave me the heads up and, and uh, sure enough, like the next day or maybe even, you know, half a day later, we, we were told that the show was, was being canceled. Um, and it wasn't even at the end of the season. This was like four or five weeks in. So what kind of vision did you have for Wrestling Society X had it gone past the season, if it went two, three, four seasons? And what was your long-term plan for Wrestling Society X? You know, my hope and goal and what we had tried to explain to MTV from the beginning was that there was a true brand that could be built here, that could go on tour and create revenue, that could go on pay-per-view and create revenue, that could have merchandising. And, you know, one of the things that I would often, you know, say to them was, look, you know, Laguna Beach or, you know, whatever your other shows are, you know, you might be able to sell some DVDs. Maybe you'll sell a logo shirt, but you're not making a video game. You're not, uh, you know, taking these things live on tour. But what I found out and, you know, kind of makes sense in a way, but really doesn't in other terms, is that when you're dealing with television executives who's entire mission in life or entire job is to focus on TV ratings. You're not going to get people that really want to focus on anything outside of TV. You know, it's kind of what we see in some instances with uh, Lucha Underground today. You know, it's, it's very clear and it's awesome for fans who watch Lucha Underground that they're not focused on building to a pay-per-view. They're not focused on anything except for delivering the best show in that hour that's going to bring eyeballs to El Rey Network. And so that's kind of what the MTV execs were focused on, was let's not worry about anything other than what we're responsible for as executives, which is building it to uh, you know television views and eyeballs. When people talk about Wrestling Society X today, oftentimes the conversation turns to comparisons between WSX and Lucha Underground on the El Rey Network. Now, what do you think when people make those comparisons? Is, is it a fair comparison? I definitely understand the comparison um, at some of the basic levels to Lucha Underground and Wrestling Society X. I mean, their whole vibe is Underground Fight Club. Our vibe was Underground Fight Club. Uh, you know, their first season... Every episode started with a band playing. Our show opened every episode with a band playing. Even the cast, um, Vampiro, Ricky Banderas, Lil Cholo, uh, B-Boy, Jack Evans. Uh, uh, there was a, a, others as well. Um, so there was absolutely a, a reason to compare the two. Um, I know that when they had Media Day, before the first season started, somebody there had asked one of the producers about the comparisons. And he said, well, the difference between Wrestling Society X and Lucha Underground is that here we have a network that's totally backing what we're doing. And that is absolutely true. I mean, the relationship that the Lucha Underground show has with the El Rey network, uh, I would have given anything to have that kind of relationship with MTV. There is no doubt that at its core, Lucha Underground is something very different, not just than Wrestling Society X, but than anything that's ever been done in pro wrestling. Um, you know, even though they still don't really explain it this way, I absolutely feel like it is the first telenovela, the first drama that happens to be about pro wrestling and contain full pro wrestling matches. I don't think that they, you know, really necessarily took from it. But what I what I like to say is that I think that, you know, if the ideas that we had were good enough for Robert Rodriguez 
and Mark Burnett to, you know, sign off on or do similar things to, then that just to me validates, you know, what we were trying to do the whole time and, and, and what we hopefully could have accomplished had things gone a little bit differently. So Kevin, it's been 10 years after the pilot was filmed for Wrestling Society X and so much has happened since then. What would you consider to be Wrestling Society X's biggest legacy? I hope that despite what actually happened with, you know, the network maybe having more influence than originally intended or with the show being canceled after just a few weeks, I hope that really the legacy is that people shouldn't stop trying, um, that people should be out there trying to help build the wrestling fan base and, and change what it is that people perceive pro wrestling to be because there is a great number of talent out there and there is so much more that I think we as an industry can be doing. Um, and so I think that the legacy hopefully is we tried to do something that was modern and that featured a lot of great up and coming talent or talent that just hadn't had the national spotlight shined on them. And that when people remember wrestling society X, yes, they can remember the insanity of the explosions and they might remember the crappiness of some of the editing, but that they'll remember that, it was also a very exciting show and it was really easy to, you know, sit through for that half hour and that there was a lot of talent there that hadn't been seen on that national level and have now gone on to do great and amazing things. We are part of an industry that we were probably never supposed to be part of had the people, the gatekeepers of olden days, um, had their way. You know, uh, I'm a guy who at the age of 12 decided that I wanted to work in pro wrestling and I was going to do absolutely everything that I could do to make that my career. And I went to college and I got a degree and at the same time, you know, continued to, to build and, and focus on my dream of pro wrestling. So while in and of itself, yeah, you can deem uh, Wrestling Society X a failure, for me, I do it all over again. Even, even knowing now what the outcome would have been and, and knowing, um, you know, how much influence the network would have had and how bastardized, for lack of a better way of putting it, the product would have been, who wouldn't do it over? You won't find one talent that was part of that show that feels like they were treated unfairly, that they weren't compensated well, that they, you know, weren't part of something special. Um, and that's something else that I'm, you know, I'm really proud of. Uh, and, you know, uh, so for me, financially, um, career-wise, you know, best year of my life. And uh, so, you know, uh, absolutely, you know, no regrets about having, you know, done that and made the decisions um, to do it. And, yeah, it sucked when it ended. And I would have loved to see it go on and, and do more. And I'd still love, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you know, I would love for the original tapes to be out there so that people could see kind of, a less bastardized version of uh, what we were trying to do. But, um, you know, I, I do it all over again in a heartbeat. That's great. Well, tell me more about what you're doing these days. Tell me what Mass Republic is all about. Even before Wrestling Society X, uh, Lucha Libre and Lucha outside of Mexico was something that I saw as a huge opportunity. Um, Lucha Libre has always been part of everything that I've done. I think, you know, because I started in the Southern California independent scene and, you know, Lucha's everywhere uh, in, in indie wrestling out here. After Wrestling Society X, I knew that I wanted to find what for me would be the next focus for my energies in pro wrestling. And it had to be, again, something that wasn't going to be seen as, you know, directly trying to be WWE. And, and I really identified Lucha Libre not only because of my own love and interest in, in Lucha Libre and the Lucha style of pro wrestling, but it seemed like the biggest growth potential for something pro wrestling related, um, definitely in the United States and probably across the globe. I, I kind of call it the golden triangle. Like you've got Hispanics who have a really uh, close affinity for Lucha Libre. 
because, you know, especially Mexicans, because it's part of what they grew up with, what their parents grew up with, what their grandparents grew up with. Then you've got pro wrestling fans who just love wrestling and who love the high-flying, colorful version of pro wrestling that is Lucha Libre. And then with Lucha, you've also got what I call the pop culture fan, Um, the fan that would never be seen in a John Cena t-shirt, but would rep a shirt with a mask on it, even if they had no idea that it was a Santo mask or a Blue Demon mask or whatever mask it was. Um, And that who would go to a Lucha Libre event because it's seen as like going to a cool cultural event or seen like going to Cirque or something like that, as opposed to, you know, they would never buy a ticket to go see WWE at the, you know, Staples Center or something. And so to me, that was what I wanted to focus all of my energies inside the pro wrestling world on was, was Lucha Libre. And we work very hard to work directly with luchadors to create officially licensed merchandise that you can get at our luchashop.com or in our Lucha Loot uh, boxes and, and crates so that we know that the fans are getting authentic merchandise. The wrestlers are getting compensated um, for having their merchandise created and distributed. And so that's one of the things that we do. But we also do um, television development and pay-per-views. Looking forward really to um, bringing a lot of this cool new Lucha Libre and Lucha Influence stuff to fans of of wrestling and fans of Lucha Libre. And, um, you know, best place to learn about all that stuff is just to follow at Master Public on Twitter and uh, and stay abreast of, of what we've got cooking over here. Awesome. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for coming onto the show and lending us your perspective, your side of the story for Wrestling Society X. I think I speak for all the regretters out there when I say it's very much appreciated. Thanks to everyone who watched this interview. Be sure to thumbs up the video if you like it, comment below, subscribe to Wrestling with Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.